Well, good evening, everybody, or good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me along today. Um, I've got to say I'm quite jealous of all the, um, the great insights and services that you guys get through Board Beer. It's uh, kind of a fantastic thing to have as a brand. So, um, yeah, without further ado. So what I'm going to do is talk you through the MoMA journey a little bit, um, then talk about our products, and then look at our approach to sales, marketing, and how we approach product development, how we decide what we're going to do next. So... I'm a farmer's son, as John said, from Staffordshire. Um, both of my brothers are back home farming, uh, pigs, chickens, arable. I'm the black sheep of the family. Um, came down to London after uni, worked as a management consultant, which basically meant I was hunched over a laptop looking at Excel for 12 hours a day. Um, I was pretty average as a management consultant. Um, it wasn't really my cup of tea. Always wanted to do my own business, always thought I would do my own business. And it struck me that there's a real gap in the market for on-the-go breakfast. So like a, a good management consultant, I did my research, uh, desktop research, looking at Mintel reports and so on. And then I sent a survey out to friends asking them what their breakfast eating habits were and what was important to them at breakfast. And as I expected, it came back that what was important was firstly uh, something that was tasty. I think that's a given with any food product. But then healthy, filling, and fast. Uh, and those are still, we'll see later on, those are still key trends on the market now. Healthy, filling, and fast breakfast. Um, so I decided it, kind of, this was the idea. It made, made sense as a concept, and it was time to actually roll up my sleeves and do a trial. So I went down to Tesco, bought a load of uh, water bottles, emptied the water out, took the labels off, put stick to my own labels on the outside, uh, went down to New Covent Garden Market, bought some fruit, spent all night in my living room blending oats, yogurt, and fruit together and pouring it into these water bottles. And my poor flatmates didn't get much sleep that night. Um, then in the morning, I went out onto the streets in Waterloo and gave away these products to people on their way to work, took their business card and gave them a product. I then got into the office a little bit late that day, uh, sent out the survey, um, asking people what they thought of the breakfast. And I got a few dodgy replies. Uh, somebody said, uh, thanks very much for the breakfast. I didn't actually try it because I didn't trust the dodgy bloke under the bridge in Waterloo. <laughs> Someone else said, uh, thank you very much. Um, it actually made me sick because it was so filling, um, which is a bit of a backhanded compliment because it's supposed to be filling. But anyway, on the whole, I thought the feedback was pretty good. So it gave me the impetus to leave my job. Um, the next step was finding a place to actually sell these breakfasts. And I thought, if I'm doing a breakfast company, let's just sell the products at breakfast time to commuters on their way to work. So I spent the next month in train stations with a clicker, counting the number of people walking by. And I reckoned if I had 10,000 people walking by and 2% of those stopped to buy breakfast, that would be 200 people. At two pounds each, that would be 400 pounds revenue a day, which, laid, which covered my costs and gave me a bit of profit. So pretty kind of, uh, <coughs> kind of back of the envelope calculations. I um, actually got kicked out of a couple of stations, got evicted uh, from the police, by the police from Charing Cross Station for loitering. Um, but uh, anyway, eventually we got a pitch in Waterloo East train station, which is, uh, for anyone that knows that, it's the bridge between Waterloo East and Waterloo stations in London. Um, it then turned from being this kind of pie-in-the-sky idea of this business that was going to happen to something that was actually a reality. We had a pitch ready to launch our first stall. Um, so it turned very much hands-on. It was finalizing the recipes, holding uh, consumer tasting groups with friends to finalize the recipes, um, doing our first design project, um, which only cost £2,000. I wish design projects cost that much these days. Um, finding our kitchens, which was a railway arch down in Deptford, and kind of starting to assemble a team. So I'll take you through a few of those photos from the early days. Uh, then we launched 24th of February 2006. So this was uh, right in the early days. You'll be pleased to know that everyone wears hair nets now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they don't use kitchen blenders either. In fact, we, we, all of our production is now outsourced. We did some in-house for six years. Uh, so it's all outsourced to BRC accredited facilities, if you're worried. Um, a couple of interesting stories with our van. The day before we launched, I was underneath the van in the middle, and we used to put the stalls in the van and drive them to the train station, then unload them down that ramp. Um, I was fi fixing a winch under the van, and this, this guy ran out of our railway arch, and he'd nicked something, and I didn't know what it was. So I chased after him. Um, admittedly, he didn't see me chasing him. 
Uh, and then uh, I managed to bear hug him halfway down the high street, and he had my laptop under his coat with all my recipes on and all the business plan and everything. So kind of it almost didn't start, but kind of luckily we got the laptop back. And then on the right-hand side, um, we used to load up the vans in the middle of the night. So we used to, we used to make daily, actually, uh, fresh stock. Um, and the guys were loading up the van, and all of a sudden the van drove off. So someone kind of jumped over the fence and tried to steal the van. Um, they promptly kind of crashed it into one of the railway arches on the stanchions on the railway arch and peeled open the side of the van on one of the, one of the stanchions. Uh, the guy did a runner. The guys tried to catch him, but they couldn't. And all that was left was a half-drunk bottle of vodka on the passenger seat. Um, so, yeah, a few interesting stories from the early days. Um, this was the kitchen uh, and the guys down in the kitchen. So a really manual operation. It was really tough. Um, we used to start work at... Uh, quarter, uh, we used to get up at half, uh, quarter to two, start work at half past two in the morning. Uh, we'd make products, kind of deliver them to train stations, start selling at half past six in the morning. So back in those early days, a really heavy operational business, which was really exciting, but kind of a mix of fun memories and kind of really tough memories as well. Um, this was our first stall on the left in Waterloo East train station. It's actually a filing cabinet on wheels with branding on the outside. Uh, and you see a header board there which used to pivot down, so the header board would fold down and then we'd push the stall along, load it into the van, take it to the kitchen, unload it, and then load it up for the next day. Um, so yeah, really exciting back in those days. And this was one of the first pop-ups in London, really, and now kind of pop-ups is quite a common theme. Um, so a short video on what we're doing. At MoMA, we think all mornings should start with oats. We believe it's our job to unleash their undeniable health credentials and turn mornings from this into this. We know mornings can be manic and miserable and often taking the time to eat something nutritious can fall by the wayside. So here at MoMA, we've created a range of tasty morning saviors that are ready in minutes so you can achieve your daily goals without the compromise. We use only the best whole grain British oats, meaning you get all the fibre, vitamins and slow release energy packed into what we believe is the best birch muesli and porridge on the market today. When I started Mama, we had one makeshift stall in Waterloo Station and made all our products in a railway arch in South East London. The journey from then to now has been amazing and we now stock Mama in supermarkets nationally and trains, airlines and offices around the world. Mom was really special because it was born out of a real need for a healthy, filling, on-the-go breakfast. Quick, easy, convenient, delicious. Anything where we think we can bring innovation to oats and help make people's mornings better. Great, so that's just kind of a bit of from those early days where it was kind of really kind of a grassroots startup up to kind of where we are now. So just to talk you through our products, so MoMA stands for making oats more awesome. So anything we can do that can take oats and add some value to it, whether it's in porridge or birch muesli or various other product development that we're looking at. Um, this is our range, so birch muesli on the top, um, oats, yogurt and fruit, so a chilled short shelf life product. Um, a birch muesli mix, um, which is a kind of a first venture into kind of the, the regular at-home cereal. Um, a breakfast smoothie, the breakfast drink market, a really tough market actually. Um, Weetabix are doing well there, but it's a, but it's a tough market. Um, and then porridge at the bottom, this is where we've had a lot of luck actually, or a lot of, a lot of success. Um, so we do eight flavours, all gluten-free, three of them are dairy-free as well. Um, only three of them are sweetened, the others have no added sugar or, or sweetened a little bit with a coconut blossom sugar. Um, so yeah, porridge is, is where our business is growing. There's a few, a few shots of our, of our products in store. And then kind of going on to the sales side of the business, so to talk you through the evolution of the business as we've gone over the last 12 years. So. This is the story of, of MoMA. In, in pink, the light pink, you can see the stalls in the train stations. And the reason for showing you this slide is just to see kind of the evolution and the way we've had to change our focus as we've gone along. You know, it's been a long journey over 12 years. Um, so at the beginning, focusing on the stalls <coughs> in the train stations, those peaked in 2008. Then we gradually decided to close those down because I thought the potential for the business was not in having a consumer-facing retail outlet but focusing on our products and getting our products into other retailers. Um, so we focused on that between 2009 and 2011. Um, then we, we stopped any in-house production. We stopped our stalls in 2012, uh, really focused on our Birch Muesli. We moved manufacturer and really grew the Birch Muesli side of the business. 
I knew that there was a limit to how big we could make Birch Muesli, though. Short shelf life products, relatively niche within the grocery field. Um, and then the last four years has been focused on porridge, which is where we've seen the big success. And all that growth has been driven by porridge. So we're now continuing to focus on porridge, as well as our Birch Muesli, and then look at all sorts of MPD that fit within the brand. <coughs> These are some of the customers uh, we're on, so kind of everywhere from, from customers that would uh, like EasyJet and Weatherspoons up to kind of BA, Eurostar, those sort of places. So really pleased with the breadth we've got. We started a lot in the travel sector in those uh, grab-and-go outlets in train stations, and then we've progressed more into, uh, into grocery sector more recently. This is a split by the different channels. So we used to under-trade, I think, in supermarkets. We're now kind of... We're, supermarkets will continue to grow and will continue to have a bigger share, but it probably won't be that much bigger as a proportion going forward. Um, wholesalers, travel and convenience is kind of where we really started. Uh, and then export, relatively small, but something where we're having quite a bit of a success at the moment, and we probably will focus on that a lot more as a str strategically focus on it over the coming years. So, onto the marketing side of things. So, what's MoMA all about? Uh, we're all about taking the AM mayhem and turning it into a MoMA morning. So, um, we all know kind of how tricky mornings can be. So, if we can make mornings a little bit better for people, that's what we try and do. Um, so, it goes back to kind of why I started the business. I knew if I didn't have a decent breakfast in the morning, I would just be a lot less productive. So if we can provide a good breakfast to people that tastes great and helps them get more out of their mornings, then that's what makes me happy. And I think we're doing a pretty good job if we can do that. Um, in terms of our audience, and we do look quite a lot of this. This is uh, a split between YouGov data, and we do surveys uh, with YouGov every now and again to kind of get, to find out who's aware of MoMA in different parts of the country. Uh, and also AMIA data, which is uh, from Nectar Card, loyalty card data from Sainsbury's. So um, 25 to 55, so kind of quite a broad age range in porridge. Um, more female bias, bias towards ABC1, which you'd expect from a more premium brand. Um, family income spend, not a lot to say there, other than we do overtrade slightly um, kind of at the higher end of the scale. Um, location, overtrade in London and the southeast. You know, that's where we started as a brand. We've got a lot more awareness there. There's still a lot of people that know us from our days of uh, the stalls in the train stations, which stopped uh, back in 2012. Um, and employment side of things, yeah, kind of we, we do overtrade with people that are working full-time, with people having MoMA at their desk in the mornings. Uh, and... This is just to say there's, there's no kind of uh, right or wrong place way, I think, for people to be positioned. It's just I'm pleased that we're slightly different to other people, so we have a kind of a, a space of our own a little bit. So we do overtrade with confident cooks, which is a Sainsbury's, Sainsbury's term. Uh, so that's kind of foodie people. So we like to think of ourselves as the convenient option for foodie people when they don't have the time to prepare stuff themselves. Um, on to kind of our marketing suite and what we do within our marketing. So PR has always been a, a fundamental foundation within our marketing repertoire. So whether it's a business profile piece or a product placement piece or kind of a fun little idea to get some press. So this is our, our minty fresh porridge, which is based on the fact that people don't like going to work with bad breath. So now you can eat your porridge and freshen your breath at the same time. Um, so, just a fun little idea, a limited edition porridge um, that didn't cost us anything and kind of got some good PR off the back of it. So, um, I do think PR is really important, particularly for foodie brands, more premium brands, and particularly if there's a good kind of story behind the business. Um, digital, so, covers a whole host of things. So, within what we do, obviously, social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, we do a lot on Facebook in terms of paid-for ads at the moment. It's something we're really looking at. Um, interestingly, we kind of think that uh, our return on investment decreases beyond a certain limit with Facebook ads, so that kind of might be an interesting area if anyone's got any feedback on that later. Um, pay, uh, PPC, all those sort of things, so a huge range of stuff within digital. Um, design, so we, we have a, a, a designer on retainer, so he kind of turns around any small projects that we've got. We have an agency that we work, we work with whenever we're launching a new product to make sure it's in line with what we're uh, kind of our brand guidelines. 
And then if, if we're ever doing a fundamental redesign, reposition of the brand, we'll engage a larger agency. We've done that a couple of times, uh, 2010 with Pearl Fisher and 2015 with an agency called uh, Brand Opus. So those have been kind of fundamental milestones as we've gone along. Uh, sampling and events. Um, if, you, if you really believe in your product, uh, and also it's in a format that's suitable for sampling, then I really believe sampling can be a really successful way to kind of drive penetration into the market. You do have to be very careful of the maths, though. You know, really look at the costs. Does, does it stack up versus the number of people you're sampling? Uh, and so an example of a good sampling for us is, you know, we had a sachet in all the marathon bags, the London marathon bags last week or a couple of weeks ago. Um, so that's kind of all the investment goes into the product. We know it's getting into the hands of people that are our target market. You know, they're the, they're the sporty people. We're not just a sporty brand, but we definitely appeal to people in that sector. So that was kind of a good sampling initiative to us. Moving on to events, kind of, uh, events side of things. With consumer events, we've actually dialed down some of our consumer events because we felt that the costs were too high relative to the number of people we were reaching. So. It might, we might get a great bit of buzz by being at an event for two or three days, but the costs are really high because we've got three or four staff there, and we've got to pay for the pitch, we've got to pay for hotel rooms, and we might be touching 3,000 people or something, of which, I don't know, 5% may go on to become regular customers. So I think it's really important to analyze those things and really try and dig down into kind of the return on investment that you're getting. Um, we also do quite a few trade marketing events, uh, which we found really useful over the years. But again, we chop and change a little bit. If we've got a product that's new to market, then trade events are really useful. So we do trade events with new products or where we feel we have to have a, have a presence there to keep our awareness high. Um, advertising, so this really refers to any kind of <coughs> big campaign that we do. This was a campaign in tube stations in London, uh, but equally could apply to kind of a big push on digital, on Facebook advertising, or a big push on sampling, for example. And one thing we're toying with at the moment is whether to have kind of a consistent marketing spend throughout the year, whether that's the right approach, an always-on approach, or whether to have a big burst, a big campaign once or even twice a year. Um, so it'd be interesting to hear what other people think about that. Um, price promotion is still kind of our, uh, easily our biggest um, way of driving customers, driving awareness, and where a lot of our spend goes. Uh, and trade marketing, so spend with specific retailers. Um, so that's kind of our marketing uh, kind of repertoire there. We try and look at price per acquisition of new customers. So there's a lot of assumptions in there, but we try and drive to that. Uh, and then we do brand awareness studies through YouGov periodically to kind of test how our brand awareness, our prompted brand awareness is, is changing across the country. Um, product development. Um, so this is our, pr our, our approach to product development. So um, actually first talk about the trends on the market, sorry. So convenience uh, is a continuing trend on the market, uh, always has been kind of, kind of over the last 10 years since we started the business. Filling, really obvious for a breakfast product, but kind of filling is really important. And then the other three really refer to health. So Freeform um, is continuing to grow. And there it says plant-based dairy alternatives are gaining traction. I'd say they're actually booming at the moment. Um, gut health is probably a newer thing that's coming on. It's kind of coming to the fore again. Uh, and no added sugar has been at the forefront for the last few years. So yeah, healthy, filling, fast, still the three key things, I think, on the marketplace. Just what is healthy changes in terms of consumers' views. Um, in terms of product developments, so we try to put things through a funnel and be quite objective about it. So commercially, is there a big enough market for the products? Um, are the trends in the market with us? Are we going to make margin out of the product? There's no point creating something that's really clever innovation um, if it doesn't actually sell or if you're not going to make enough margin on that product. So I think people can fall into that trap a little bit. Um, can you, this is an example here of something, our hodgepodge, we used to sell really well on the stalls, but when it came to retail, the market was really saturated with own label and really hard to make a good margin on it. So this is an example of something that we, we didn't do because of that reason. Um, quality, better and consistently good quality, so really important that you can do things better than the, the competitors. Um, good brand fit, so our Birch & Muesli, it's not an on-the-go format, but I feel is sufficiently close to the brand because it is a, it's a quick cook Birch & Muesli, uh, and we do Birch & Muesli, so I thought it was sufficiently close to the brand to fit there. 
Um, sales market access, this is just if you're going from one category to another, have you got the contacts in the marketplace to really make it work? So we went into drinks, and it's not a total roadblock, but it definitely makes it harder when you've got to meet a whole new set of buyers. You've got to understand a totally different category. Uh, and then capability on the manufacturing side of things. Have you got the capability or is somebody else? Can you do it in the UK or do you have to go abroad? It all makes it kind of a little bit harder, kind of the further away you have to go. Um, then passion versus objectivity. So this is kind of a big thing for me at the moment. Um, I think the uh, kind of getting this balance right is really important. So I think it's really important to have the passion, which I think small businesses have in, in shed loads. You know, it's really important to dream, to think outside the box, to have a certain amount of naivety so you're not constrained by convention. But equally, you've got to balance that with objectivity and actually kind of looking at, you know, will this product really work? It's very easy to get carried away with too much passion. Uh, and not realize actually something needs changing. So it's important not to let kind of passion cloud your objectivity or not to let objectivity kind of dampen down your passion. Uh, and a little quote here, I can't change the direction of the wind, but I can adjust my sails to always reach my destination. So this is about not being afraid to pivot within your business. If kind of you know where you're going, but it's not quite working, don't be afraid to kind of try something else. And we've done that a couple of times, probably too late. You know, we had the stalls and the train stations, we moved away from those. We were kind of really pushing on birch muesli. We still got bircher, but our focus has changed and, and pushed on porridge. So, um, you know, we're still heading in the same way, but we've, we've changed tack a couple of times. So just a couple of quick slides just to finish up now. So this is kind of the structure of the business. Um, it's kind of a lot of people will work like this. We've got, got different manufacturers that we work with. It feeds into a central storage system and then goes out there to our customers. So <coughs> in the MoMA head office, we're focused on sales, marketing, product development. We don't, uh, we, go, don't get, we don't get involved in the actual manufacturing, although we're very close to the products. With some of them, we source all the ingredients. We're very on top of the kind of quality control on that side of things. Um, and then this is the team. So these are the guys that actually do all the hard work. So kind of it's all down to these guys. Uh, and we're kind of structured like, like a lot of businesses would be. You know, kind of got ops and finance, innovation, marketing, and sales. But it's, uh, it's down to these guys. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thank you very much.